Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. We're back deep diving into the core technology of cracking C64 games. And uh, this time we're not only cracking anything, we are cracking one of the like three or four most difficult protections that exist on the platform. This is Pirate Slayer Boot. Uh, in all fairness, the episode does not kind of end up the way I planned it to be because the original thought was to have an interview with Chris uh, who developed the actual protection and then have like a second phase, the digging through the protection and showing you how it's constructed uh, as sort of a reference to, uh, to the interview. I did the digging in the protection long time ago, so it's it's something that had been sitting and uh, and um, yeah, I I did I do have a, an ongoing discussion with Chris on when we're going to have this interview, and hopefully we will have it eventually. And I think that will still be like a full episode. So, and and the 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 deep diving is also like a full episode. So um, yeah, well, we might have needed to split it anyway. So uh, this might. Be uh, no harm in releasing this second part first. So, hopefully, hopefully, we will have an interview with Chris at some point in time um, before <laughs> like summer, fingers crossed. So, uh, but now we will dive, dive deep dive into uh, Pirate Slayer Boot. And, and just so you understand it, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm having multiple screens and multiple documents at the same time and also trying to type and, you know, I'm, I'm a guy, which means I can barely do one thing at a time. So um, bear with me for a bit of confusion at, time, confusion at times. The other part I wanted to say is that the way I crack the game, I, I need to uh, understand how you interface the loader, but I rarely need to understand the actual loader, the part that sits in the disk drive that checks the protection. If I have an original, I can use the original, original loader and extract the files I want to have, and I have them extracted, which means that I'm perfectly fine because then I'm removing the entire protection. And however that protection worked, I really don't need to understand it to do it like I normally do. But uh, so, uh, and, and the, in this process, I'm also going to the very point where the the main decryption of the disk drive code is is done. So, uh, but I'm not going through the actual disk drive code as well. And, and there is no description also on uh, how it detects what on the disk. Um, I can have that too, if you're interested. Um, I haven't dug through that because again, that's not really relevant based on my normal modus operandi. But if you're really interested in that, then let me know in the comments down below and I will do that as well. Have a look at this one and tell me what you think. And fingers crossed that Chris will eventually make himself available so we can have a discussion with him. I know that is going to be interesting. There is a, a an interview with him on Lemon64, but it's I think it's 10, 12 years old. So um, I, I'm sure I can contribute with a number or, or potentially more interesting questions than you would have there. But uh, until we have the talk with Chris, let's, let's take a deep dive into his code now. In 2015, my scene career was basically over. I had quit since many years. I hadn't done anything for years. Uh, I did sort of keep myself updated. I read a few forums, including CSDB and, and all of that. And I was watching YouTube videos of uh, the, the cooler demos released and all of that. But um, my days at the scene, they were totally over and uh, the interest was sort of fading from the platform as such. But then in 2015, Enno, Burglar of Success, announced a competition, a cracking competition. Uh, he provided uh, a deadline uh, months into the future. So we had months to actually uh, execute something. The ambition was to crack the game uh, Return of Heracles, uh, an old electronic arts uh, role-playing game. Um, not the best game ever written, but uh, it's a role-playing game and uh, 
and he was really old at the time, but it seems there was no proper version around. So Eno thought, why not make a competition out of this? And and he did, and he announced that on CSDB. And uh, well, you know, um, I didn't really have a tool chain for, for doing anything. And uh, there there have been so many new tools released and, and I didn't really have any experience in using them. So, uh, but um, well, yeah, you know, Let's just take a look, see what this is. And uh, it shows that the the loader is Pirate Slayer Boot. Um, and I was experienced in Pirate Slayer Boot because uh, a number of years before, uh, I, I together with Harald Fragner and Anders Jansson, we had looked through the, uh, the Pirate Slayer Boot that's also on Bart's tail. So um, yeah, I, I sort of, I, I knew my way around it, sort of. Uh, I know the core um, protection there, the heavily guarded disk drive routine that sits in there. So I started uh, kind of dissecting this and documenting it and, uh, and wrote a rather thorough documentation on uh, on how to hack my way through it and uh, yeah and I also managed to uh, wake up uh, Rowdy out of his uh, hibernation and uh, so together with Rowdy uh, we managed to crack this uh, eventually um, by the time that the competition ended we hadn't concluded the save part of the, of the loader because uh, having an IFFL and, and a save routine at the same time was sort of something we didn't have then uh, to be honest I don't still don't have that so uh, or I, um, I I do have it sort of in the form of Nostos but I haven't used Nostos so I'm, I don't have any experience in actually actually using what I have but uh, disregarding that what we are now going to do this time is looking at Pirate Slayer Boot. I tend to slip here and say Pirate Slayer Boot. I think that's a handier way to say it, but but the correct name is Pirate Slayer Boot. Uh, I'm using my old notes, um, but uh, this time I I went through them again and I've updated them. Um, and and bear with me. What you will see now is sort of a, a rather confused uh, run through of everything, and we can't dive into all the details of it. But but hopefully you will kind of be able to pick up enough to kind of find your way around. And if you are interested in the the details, I can. Show Share you my document, the, the the source document I have describing all the steps, uh, which might be more readable to you than than seeing me read the document and and browsing through or traversing through the loader at the same time. Because at times this will be a bit confusing, and and I would like to apologize beforehand on that. So over to me dissecting Pirate Slayer boot. All protections, uh, and, and now we're sort of not looking into manual protection and code wheels, but the, the technical protections on the disk, they, they contain of two parts. They, they are sort of two necessary parts. One is some sort of feature on the disk which couldn't be replicated or where the ambition is that it shouldn't be replicated. But then um, the uh, the copy programs developed so they could copy more and more stuff. So the initial things, they were like uh, just format errors and eventually um, copy programs could copy that. And, uh, and then it added uh, extra data on track 36 and onwards. So outside of the 35, which is sort of the standard DOS part of the disk uh, and then copy programs could do that as well and then it had stuff like you had the sync mark so sync mark is uh, um, what the, the header reads to to tell the uh, the logic that now comes the track data uh, or the sector data and then um, then the, the protection would bump the head to the 
the, the neighboring track and then read the sector data from there. So you would have the sync on one track and then you would have the data on, on another track. And, and because the, the way the 1541 is constructed, that is particularly hard to duplicate because on a PC disk drive, uh, it uses this little hole to tell where it is on the disk. So uh, at, at the time where this little hole you can see that on, on the five and a quarter inch disc, you would have that little hole. And if you have some sort of diet that, that lies through that hole, then the drive could tell if the when it is on a particular point in the in the in the turning of the disc inside the sleeve. And uh, but the 1541 doesn't use that. So it doesn't know where it is. So um, on the actual track, it just reads the track and then it finds the sector it wants and then reads that and then everything is fine. On the PC disk, uh, all the, the sector zeros of a track are aligned to like, let's call that like 12 o'clock. Whereas on the 1541, you can have track zero starting on, on like three o'clock and then track one out on eight o'clock and it wouldn't be totally clueless on that. And that is why it's very difficult to, to replicate that particular scenario on a 1541. So it's easy to, or it's, it's easy to, to write it if you have dedicated software that does, does just that. But then reading it on the 1541 is also easy if you have some sort of mechanism that bumps the head at the correct point in time. But then writing it, you need dedicated code for that. And then the general copy program would have very big problems uh, doing p just that. So that, that is sort of one of the features that would also be very difficult to replicate. I'm not saying that this has anything to do with the protection we have at hand, but, but so the, the anomaly on the disk is one thing, and then you would need some sort of code that validates if the anomaly is there. If it isn't, that is highly indicative of the disk uh, being a copy. And then the program shouldn't work or it should fail or <laughs> do whatever it, it, it wants to do when it realizes that it's probably run out of a copy. Uh, the, the code that validates the anomaly is typically ciphered and, and encrypted and guarded by the program. And to be honest, what we are going to look at today is the obfuscation and how the uh, the Pirate Slayer boot tries to hide that core logic. That is a piece of code that it sends into the disk drive, which then sits in, inside the disk drive. So the loader and the validator of the, the speed loader and the validator of the copy protection, they are normally integrated and they sit inside the disk drive. And this was particularly uh, difficult on the, on the C64 because the 1541 is, a, is a basically a computer of its own. And, and whatever you, you the freeze points and, and control of the program you can take on the computer side wouldn't apply on the disk drive side. So once the code had gone into the disk drive, it was sort of outside of your reach. So it's, it's key to ensure that you manage to de-obfuscate de everything before it was sent over to the disk drive. Otherwise, it was sort of outside of your reach. Now, with uh, with machine code monitor sitting inside emulators, you can, of course, set breakpoints inside the disk drive and all of that. But uh, uh, yeah, we, we weren't that lucky back then. So, uh, but we will go through the obfuscation routine. Routine. We will not look at the actual uh, error or or and normally it uses on the disk. We will not even look at the disk drive code that validates the, uh, the error on the disk. We will just look at how you can traverse yourself into the obfuscation and we will do a bit of digging around and see the techniques it uses for yeah, for the obfuscation. I hope that was sort of clear. So let's move into uh, Pirate Slayer Boot. Oh uh, yeah. Oh. First, I will start the uh, Deal Master. Um, very good program. If you don't have this one, then download it. 
uh, I should show you this. So this is Style, uh, The Wiz, Chris McBain and Elvix. Um, doing most of that uh it, it's a super nice program and you really should try to uh, to download that because if you have uh, if you are even the slightest interested in in anything related to the c64 this is uh, one of the must-have tools so style64.org slash dmaster uh, when you look at the directory of, of a pirate slayer boot, it looks like this. So this is a G64 um, that is fully protected. Uh, there is an EA file, Electronic Arts, and then there is a loader file, which is 22 blocks. This one is just doing basically the, the initial boot, and this one includes all the obfuscation that we want to look at. Uh, and the rest of the data is stored directly onto uh, onto the disk. They are not visible via the directory, so uh, you would need a special mechanism to get access to them. Uh, and we will get to that in a bit. Uh, let's first look at this. So this booter file is is it loads to uh, address F7, so very high on the on the zero page on on the first yeah that's the first page is the zero page oh yeah well i hope you understand what i mean from address zero zero f7 and then there is stuff that looks weird uh, we will have a look at that and then uh on address 100 and onwards that is the stack so uh stack memory on the c64 that's a statically allocated place in memory of the stack uh, on 16-bit machine, that tends to be something we can push around, and, and on modern machines, uh, sort of every application would have their own stack or heap. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is code that looks very readable here. This is uh, the, this is actually the, the the part that loads the next the the loader. Uh, and but you will see here it jumps to FFD5. Um, so the way the auto starts loads on this one is that here on the lower part of the stack you would see 020202. Zero two, zero two, zero two. So that means that when when your normal loader, when the stock kernel has loaded this using comma eight comma one, it will. Yeah, it will bump into an RTS and then the RTS would look at the stack and push the two addresses from there, the low byte and high byte. So, uh, and there, there is a high degree of probability that it will push this because the stack would just overload it. And uh, this means that it would bump to address 0203. Uh, yeah. So that's what this is. And then you would have this piece of code, which is the last part. And this looks like garbage, but it, it is actually not. It's illegal opcode, but the master cannot handle uh, illegal opcodes. I would really want it to. And uh, Chris has indicated to me that uh, uh, there is actually code behind it. It's just not enabled. So uh, Chris, if you look at this or Elvis, if you, Elvis, if you are looking at this, please enable that or, or at least make it selectable and that would be highly appreciated. Okay, uh, let's see if we have, uh, yeah, we can start, uh, start an emulator window here. Um, and we do like this, we set a breakpoint on 0203. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, we can do uh, like fully normal one like that. Hmm, there is actually something I should do first. So, uh, load, comma eight. That loads to basic, so it doesn't load on the absolute address. It doesn't load to load memory. It always loads to 0801. And here you can see that there is something, uh, there is a basic header on the file. And uh, let's let's do it like this. So we do view and we view it as hex. And here you see that there is something here that is the basic header. So if you load it to basic, it will show the basic header, the one you just saw. And if you load it to 
comma eight comma one it loads directly and the well the basic header is of course loaded somewhere on the top of the stack but it's not used for anything it's just used if if you load it directly to uh to the basic area uh yeah okay so uh, and here you can load it okay so that was the start for 0803 uh let's see and here you can see that uh, because the vice monitor is is handling um, illegal opcodes and illegal opcodes it's 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 not criminal to use them it's just that they aren't defined in the actual standards but given the 256 potential opcodes, not all of them are defined uh, by MOS, uh, the producer of the 6502. Um, but if you are using the non-defined ones, they are sort of... Most of them are sort of acting like a mix of, of two different opcodes. And uh, an AF here... Um, yeah, AD is load accumulator from uh, this. So if, if this would have sent, said AD, it would said LDA from 0172 uh, here. But the illegal opcode is, is sort of doing a mix of load X from that address and load uh, accumulator from that address. Uh, so that's how most of them work and uh, um, given that they are not like officially defined the way that they are described is not official it's it's uh, but you can find multiple sources on on how they are defined but the uh, the mnemonics the three letter abbreviation for what the opcode is doing is not always standard they are there are people express it differently because I mean it's not a defined standard you can basically find out what you think it does um yeah so uh looking at what it's doing here and uh, sorry for not looking at you i'm not reading my notes on the side here uh so it loads a and x with 4c it's not really relevant for yeah it's it's relevant for the x here because it's it's basically setting the offset of the subsequent read of the lda so it reads uh, from 01C5 with an offset of 4C and then it reads the address uh, or the data uh, 8A here. Then transfer that and it stores to 033D and then there is another offset read, uh, a NOP which isn't doing anything, it's just garbage. And then it's transferring that to X and it's storing uh, X and A to uh, 033E and then it's reading something else and here it picks up 4C um, which is the um, the mnemonic for jump and then stores that on 033C so what it's doing here and then it's doing a jump subroutine to this so what it has done now it's reading uh, jump to FF8A because uh, this one was 8A, this one here is FF, and this one here is 4C, which is the jump. And then it stores that to this address and then generates a jump to that address. This is just to confuse you. It's basically, you can replace this entire piece of code with a uh, jump subroutine to FF8A, which is one of the uh, IO units. Okay, uh, yeah, here, uh, where are we? So this is 033C. I hope you see this. Um, I'm, if you watch this on a mobile, this might not show properly. Um, I might be able to increase the uh, the size of the uh, of the font here, but uh, well, I, I would encourage you to if you're keen on reading what I have in the machine code monitor, do watch this on a computer so you can blow it up properly. Uh, I, I guess that's a lot easier than me trying to fill the entire screen with the content of the machine code monitor. 
Okay, and then it's loading X and blah blah blah, storing to DO20 and DO21, so that's just storing, uh, what was it, O2, uh, yeah, I don't know the colors by heart, but this is storing colors in the, uh, um, yeah, in the color registers, and then it's jumping a subroutine here, uh, which is printing this byte. So yeah, somewhere here it has, um, what is it? Um, 93, it has 93 in the accumulator here. And then calling uh, this uh, F1CA, it will clear the screen. So that's what this part is doing. You could, rather than doing this, you could do LDA 93 and jump to jump to subroutine to FFD2. That would also clear the screen. But uh, you, if you want to obfuscate, this is also one of the ways to do it. 0286, uh, I think that's suppressing kernel, mes kernel messages. <coughs> and then uh, jump to 1013D. And we will go to 013D now. Uh, yeah, we, we should possibly do this. M023E. And here you would have UI. Uh, it will use that later on, which is, uh, so if you remember 023E, UI is the, well, what you can send to the disk drive to reset the disk drive. And then you also see here that 0240 is the string loader, which is the file it's going to load afterwards. Okay, uh, 013D. Um, so this is what, what it's doing next, it's uh, 023E uh, with two bytes, that's to FFB2, FFBD, and then open, so <coughs> now it's resetting the drive, so this is what it's doing there. Uh, and then 0240, six bytes and to FFBD, that is setting the file name for loader. And then it's doing a jump to FFD5. And this is one of the parts I would like to go through. Just have a bit of Fairlight TV coffee first. Normally, uh, if you have a set of calls to a number of subroutines, you would have a, a stack of jumped subroutine uh, commands. This is doing it a bit more cleverly than that. So it has the return routines for um, um, calling uh, a subroutine. So rather than doing a jump subroutine, it's just doing an RTS. And then it picks two bytes from the stack calling that. And then when that is doing an RTS, it picks the next two bytes. So it's basically populated the stack with um, the routines it would like to call. And then you don't need the jump subroutine, uh, the the in repeated line of jump subroutine. It just fills the stack with subroutines, and then the RTS will trigger the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So jump calls FFD5 is the load routine, and when load has done, it will do an RTS, and then it will pick the byte from the stack, pointing to the next routine that it should call. Uh, and I happen to know that that is uh, 0034. So let's do break 0034. <clears throat> okay, and now you can see that it loads the loader. Um, I hope it did that. Yes, it's really slow, but that's using stock kernel to load. So now we, ha we are at address 0034, so that is what the um, returning the RTS in the load routine F55 is uh, exiting using. Uh, and one of the things we can do is um, computer history. Um, so the last thing that it executed was load X from AE and uh, load Y from AF. That is the last address loaded by the loader. And then it's doing an RTS and that RTS then triggered going to 0034, which is what it found on the stack. Uh, uh, 
34. Mm, where are we now? We are here. That was one, actually one thing I should have done before. Hmm. Okay, so uh, normally... A. So you will see here that it loaded from 0267. That was the last address it poked, uh, the load routine poked. Uh, so let's see at this. So it starts at FFFA. That's the very top of memory. And then it loads over the boundary and then starts loading to the very low memory. So this is going to the zero page. Um, again, one of those things I'm pretty sure that uh, the tools back then really couldn't handle uh, because, uh, I mean, it would overflow if you would have on FFF. FF, FF, and then adding one because then we'd suddenly, if you would have a counter that would run into that the 16 bit address range wasn't enough, and you would need to have the logic that it would wrap into uh, low memory again. Okay, we should, uh, but if you look at this file, it's 22 blocks f uh, big, and if you if you look at what would be normal, if you loaded from FFFA and the last byte would be 02, uh, what was it, 0267, uh, that's basically three blocks. Why would that file be 22 blocks, but whereas it seems like you only loaded uh, three blocks? And this is where the magic starts happening. It's uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of things here that it's doing. Um, let's see where we are in my. Uh, let's do a hex dump of this one. Uh, hex dump here. So here, you, this one doesn't wrap. It's it's actually doing 100 or uh, more than the the 16 bits here. But uh, so skip the the preceding zero, the preceding one here, and and assume that that is actually address uh, 00 e as it is here. Here you say uh, pirate slayer boot program by Kit, uh, Chris Hatelid um, Regina. I think uh, this is the place in, in Canada where he lives. Um, still lives, I do believe. And then it's loading a lot of things and it has uh, a few interesting remarks like lick my user port here. And then there is a lot of things here and then it says uh, out of my code hacker. So it looks like it should load to address 14.4e or, or like 14.60 or, or something thereabout. Uh, but it's not. It was actually loading to 0267, wasn't it? That's what we concluded before. So this is where one of the, the first tricks happen. One of the things you can do is if you overload the AE and AF, the zero page addresses, which kernel is using for, for knowing where to store the next byte. So it takes the byte from the serial bus, it looks at AE and AF and places it there. Uh, and then it increases it, uh, and then it fetches the next, and then it repeats that until it's done loading. But if you load over that, you can play a lot of nice tricks. Uh, and this one is doing it more than most other loaders I've seen. Most of them just fiddle with the low byte, which makes sort of disassembly quite difficult because so you load there and then uh, the, the low byte and high byte points to at the, the AE00, so zero page address AE, that's when it stores that, and then it bumps a little bit earlier. So high byte is zero, but then, and it just does that, and then that, that, that information it loaded, it's just wasted. It's not using that for anything, it's just confusing you. But this one is doing it a bit more cleverly, because what happens here is that it stores a high byte, which is uh, ED, I think it is. Um, so it, uh, rather than loading on zero page, it starts loading in the high memory again. Um, and we will see how that looks when we get into the machine code monitor here. Um, 
uh, bang, ram. Okay, so here uh, on ED, you see here the, the typical pattern of a computer that is re randomly resetted. So FF, FF, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So basically repetition of four FFs and then four zeros. That's typically one of the patterns you can find in uninitiated memories. But here on EDB0, there is something else. So this is where the loader has bumped into. It loaded over address AE and AF, and then when it poked in AF, it poked uh, the, the value ED. And then the next byte would be loaded to EDB0, which is what you can see here. Uh, that's one of the things you can do with those uh, pointers. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, so, so basically, when you look at everything, it, it has loaded from EDB0 to 0267, was it? I think it's, I think it's that. Uh, okay, uh, where are we now? We are at the uh, address 34 and address 34. You would see an example of how it handles the stack. So we, we will bump into uh, 34. So this is the routine set interrupt load a and x from address 3. This is one of the addresses it, it has load. So we don't know what that is yet. And then it store that in address 1. Uh, which is the the bank selection register and then it's doing an RTS so um, okay so here it loaded uh, 5 to both A and X so it stores 5 which means that uh, the IO is still there but it has mapped out the uh, the kernel and the basic ROM um, and then RTS let's see where it goes it goes to 101E2. So that's the next address triggered by this RTS. If you don't have any machine code monitor such as the one in Vice, and if you're doing this manually trying to understand it, you would have so much problems. Uh, it's, it's so complexly written here. Uh, yeah, okay, let's 01E2. <clears throat> so this is the routine and again totally incomprehensible if you don't have a machine code monitor that cannot handle illegal opcodes. Uh, it's, it's doing something reading from high memory exclusive ORing with 34 and then storing it to 8000 and then it's also pulling something from the accumulator and executing an RTS. So. Again, you need to keep track of exactly where the stack pointer is because when that the next RTS here it's is hit, the one on 01F6, it will go to the data that sits in the stack, and, and you need to know where that is. So unless you have the machine code monitor that will help you do it, so let's do uh, break uh, 01F6. Okay, it stopped here, and then we could do next. And uh, so the next address here it will go to is 0210. But we will also take a little look at the uh, routine it's poked here. It has sort of generated something here on 8009. Set interrupt. Uh, yeah, it's basically setting uh, a color to to 20 and then jumping to an eternal uh it's sort of flickering between two colors i think uh, on um yeah here at the top of the memory i guess if you if you slam your cartridge if you have uh, a cartridge in uh, that could be something where that could trigger this um, i'm not sure why it's doing this but uh, but uh, but my understanding is that it would be related to triggering cartridges um yes uh where are we now we are here break that um okay and then we are at 0210 you can see here that we are at 0210 uh so it's doing more stuff on 0210 
Um, yes. Yeah, uh, well, mm, so it's taking something here, exclusive ordering, and then it's storing to address 32. And uh, address 32 and 33 are important ones, because we will come into uh, the most complex routine of the, um, of the entire loader, and that is the core obfuscation. Uh, of the drive code and, and address 32 and address 33 are the seeds value seed values of the, uh, that um, that decryption so it, it takes address the content of address 32 and 33 and feeds them into the timers and then the timer is is decreasing um, as the as the uh, routine is running and when it's doing that it, it's <laughs> it has a, a seed value stored into them which needs which needs to be fully correct because if it's not it cannot decrypt anything it will just be creating garbage so that's why you need to keep track of what the ad the, the value that goes into 32 and 33 are we can of course cheat and set the breakpoint uh, in vice uh, so we would know but uh, but back in the days that was a big hassle to find out um yeah where are we now we are here uh oh two 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 uh that is the rts so break oh two 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 that is um okay so now we have it, it has been running this and uh, here you would see that uh, it's done what it should and it's stored what it should in address 32 and we can see here that the a value here is 4b so 4b is what goes into address address 32 and if you want to make a note of that that you can do that uh, unless well of course we will set the breakpoint so you can see that it's fetching that later on Mm -mm. Okay, and then we should. Then it's doing stuff like this again. Load y with uh, with zero. Pull from the stack, and then RTS again, just to keep you on your toes that you are aware of where the stack pointer is pointing, because the pull uh, here that bumps the uh, the stack pointer one step. And then it pulls more, and then it loads something from uh, 2F, so one of the stack, uh, one of the zero page pointers. And now it bumps into zero zero five. Let's see where we are. Uh, yes, I should just, yeah, we can just bump through here. Um, how far did I want to do that? Uh, there is a loop. Okay, we are here now. O two O seven. No. Mm, yeah, it's looping there. I, I should possibly save you a bit of time. So let's do uh, F one sixty eight. It, it keeps doing sort of crap things here and uh, I'm not really relevant for what we are doing. So break F168. Okay, F168. Uh, was that really it? No. We delete all the breakpoints now and we go to F168. Okay, F1. 68 um, uh, so what this is doing it's taking the a block of memory and then sort of decompressing it um, the EOA the the square the pyramid and the circle logo that's stored uh, the rows are there and then because it doesn't fill the entire screen you would have blanks on the very end but it's stored like in one way big row so it depacks that into uh, 
uh, being in the middle of the screen. So that's uh, that's storing. It's stored in the file in a more efficient way uh, without the sort of the uh, empty spaces at at each end of the of the logo here. So this is what this is doing. Uh, and here it stores uh, colors and then turns on bitmap mode or multicolor mode and sets the colors and, and what have you not. And uh, I said before that it was storing something in address um, 32, which was one of the seed values for the core uh, decrypt of the describe code and here it's storing something in address 33 so that is the other byte uh, we can set f2 12 uh, that's after the store has been done uh, and then it would seem that the address uh, the, it was 50 that it stored there in 33 we can just check if that was the case yes it stored 50 in address 33 here uh, f12 um, I'm trying to read my notes at the same time and, and uh, if I seem confused that's probably because I am because this reading from multiple screens at the same time is not really what I do best but uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah so F21B is where this one then ends so F21B there you have a rump, uh, return from subroutine which is ending that part and then picking two new bytes from the stack which is going to call so break F21B and then we do next which means that it's returning to F30A F30A uh, and here, uh, so here it's doing stuff, uh, it, it's doing a little loop for DO12, comparing it with 80, waiting until the raster line is on, on, on 80, and then it checks for 0, and then waits until it's there. So, uh, because raster line 0 in DO12 can happen two times during the screen, I, I take for granted that they want to ensure that the first one is waiting for the lower of... Uh, of those instances you could check for do 11 and uh, check for the high bit there as well that's probably the more um, the better way to do it but uh, this works as well so the, i mean I'm, there is nothing wrong with doing it as they do and then f 32a now we're getting to the very core uh, of uh, the decryptor here f 32a and this is the part that we will go through in a bit more detail. <clears throat> so it picks from address 32 and address 33 and pokes into DD04 and DD05. These are the seed values that are set in the timer. So uh so address 32 and address 33 you need to know them when you get here otherwise you would have issues and let's see where we are we are with uh so we would set uh break we delete all the other breakpoints break f3 2a did we say that f3 2a yes i think so Okay, and now we could, uh, so uh, address 30 th uh, 32 in this case is 4B and address 33 is 50. So these are the two values it stores into the timer and it will, um, it will now use these timer values um, in the, in the D-pack. So, Every cycle they would decrease by one, which means that the <laughs> it's absolutely cycle perfect here. Uh, so unless or if you try to poke somewhere in the memory here, uh, the the 
The decrypt will not work because it will pick the value of your poke rather than what's originally there, which will fail everything. If you intercept this in any way uh, or, or change so it's even one cycle off in the timers, the decrypt will also not work because then the timers would be wrong. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get to how you did it back in the days, but just so you know that this is how how they how he implemented it, and what you see here on um, yes, so address so this is set up here the when you store in 04 05 and then it uh, fires the uh, the timer so LDA01 store in DDO DDOE this is starting the timer so now the timers are decreasing and what you see here from F339 uh, I'll let's see this portion here it's taking a, a value in i it's in Y and then it's uh, yeah, loading from DDO4. It doesn't really matter what it's fetching here, but it's storing them in F3OA. So in F3OA, that is what you have over here. So this one is actually trying the preceding code. That is the purpose of this. And this is um, what you will see if henceforward that is doing. It's taking a portion of the preceding code and just trash it. Um, and then it would decipher what comes afterwards. And then it will start executing that, trashing the preceding one. So it will have the routine where it's sort of trashing everything that's been running before and it would decipher what it's running afterwards. And then it will do that for 13 iterations. There are 13 loops which trashes the preceding, decrypts the, the subsequent, and then eventually you would run into having something that is fully decrypted once you have decrypted all the 13 loops. Uh, and I think it's actually better if I show you my word page here uh, because um, we don't have the time here to decrypt all 13 of them. Uh, so here I can show it in a decrypted format with all my comments and, and I can actually increase this one a little bit. So, uh, okay, uh, here you see my setup, the picking from 32 and 33 and then and then latching the timer here. Trashing the preceding code, uh, setting um, F300 and then uh, a Y, so it's F300 or F35B, which is here. So the f it's, it's doing all the way from where it is to the very end of the memory, um, uh, which you will see here. So it, it takes the address here, so this F35B, that's the first one. It's doing an exclusive OR with both the low byte and the high byte of the timer, storing it back, increasing Y, and then branching up. So the f the first so, sort of this is from uh, F B uh, no uh, F three five B up until F three F F. It's decrypting that. Uh, that includes the little uh, <laughs> the little loop here that would take all the next uh, high bytes uh, all the way up until FFFF. So this is one instance of the loop. And then, then the next loop starts and it looks exactly the same. It sets up a start value and then trashes everything before it. It set up the new start value and then decrypts everything after it. Uh, and you will see, see 13 instances. And uh, yeah, one of the interesting parts here is that here it's doing DD04 and DD05, that's just plain. Here it's doing DD04, DD05 and then DD04 again. Uh, here it's doing DD04, DD05 and then uh, the ASCII or the value 45, which is the ASCII value for E or the Petsky value for E. DD04, DD05, uh, uh, the Petsky value 4F, I think that's O. 
and then uh, 04, 05, and here it's A. So it's do <laughs> it has now used uh, E O A, which is what you saw on the screen, and that was the sort of the abbreviation for Electronic Arts before it became just E A. Uh, here it's using 04, 05, and then it's an exclamation mark, so 21. Uh, here is uh, using 32, again the, the seed value that uh, was used to call the routine. Uh, and here it's using 33, so it's using that in one of the instances. It needs to add something, or, or it, uh, they, I guess he feels the need to add something else here, and that's what he's adding here. And now he's uh, using 0405, and here we have a K. Uh, I think we will know what that is short for uh, in a while. So K, and then 2E here is a dot. And then we would have, uh, yeah, so k, sorry, k dot e dot h. So Chris, the coder of this, I I would imagine his he has a middle name that is. Uh, Something with E. So Chris, something with E, and then his family name starting with H. And then it's actually finally done. So on C575, you would have the RTS that is the marking the end of that super complex and very time sensitive decryption of the disk drive code. Uh, we'll move that away and then we set the breakpoint to break to F575. Uh, 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 that one ended up on the other screen here. And then we do next. And that we sh now we should end up on FF00. So after the decryption of this time sensitive loop, all the 13 iterations of it, we end up on FF00. And, and uh, I, I didn't show you how to do it. Uh, I mean, if you do this manually inside of, um, of Vice, you can set the breakpoint uh, to where the loop ends and then you set the new breakpoint where the next loop ends and, and then you can go on and traverse yourself up until the point where you have set breakpoints to all of it. Back in the days when I did this manually, I couldn't do this as part of, of kind of analyzing the entire flow of things. I needed to do it uh, I isolated this chunk of code uh, and then I launched it. So I had one chunk at 1000, one chunk at 2000, and the last chunk at, uh, well, the, the under, under kernel where it is now. And then what I did was, uh, because this points to the addresses under kernel, um, I mean, so even if, so if you take the, the code, uh, the decrypted code and put it on on address thousand and execute it there. It will still do the decryption of the of the data up until uh, up under the kernel. So if you just kind of flip out kernel, execute it, it will do a proper decryption of it. So the first part is of, is already decrypted when you start working with it, and then you can set the breakpoint there. Okay. And then, uh, so if you have the same chunk on, in all those three locations, and you run the one on thousand, and you have a breakpoint uh, at at the end of the first loop, it would trigger that breakpoint, and then you can look under kernel, and you will find the decrypted next segment. And then you take that little segment, move it to your address 1000, and then you would take a raw dump again, the one you had on 2000, and copy it under kernel so that you have a fresh, uh, fresh, fully encrypted, encrypted set under kernel. And then you could run the, the address on 1000 again with the new breakpoint after the second instance. 
You run that on the thousand and you trigger the breakpoint and now you have two decrypted segments up uh, under kernel and you move those down you set and you take a fresh set from 2000 and move them under kernel and then you <laughs> set the new breakpoint after instance 3 and then you go on until you have decrypted all 13 of them. That's how I did it back when I cracked Bard's tail. I, I, I had no idea on how to use a drive code or anything at the time. So I, I, me, Anders Jansson and Harald Fragner, we just cracked that portion and we had no idea what we should do afterwards. So we didn't really crack the game. We just sort of decrypted the most difficult part of the, of the, of the protection without knowing how we should take it onwards from there. So there, I, I've never released anything in uh, any crack of Bard's Tale, but uh, I did that when Bard's Tale was really new without knowing how to do it from cracking the, the big part of it. Um, I know Chris, uh, there is an, an interview with Chris in Lemon64 where somebody, uh, I guess Fungus, asked about that. And Chris said that he, he had no idea how they would decrypt it. But uh, so, uh, Chris? That section was for you, that's how I did it. Uh, I hope the explanation sort of explains how I would have done it. Um, yes, and now we are on FF00. Um, okay, we'll do now this assembly of FF00. Uh, what it's doing in here is setting up pointers. So from uh, it picks something from F3 and F301, F3000 and F301, and then F304 and F305. These are setting up source and destination pointers to uh, something it will copy down to the lower memory. So this would... Uh, what is... Uh, yeah, I... I could show you but but basically what is doing it's taking from f576 and storing it to 08 d4 trust me if you want to look at it please do but uh, that's what it's doing here um, yes and uh, break ff16 Yes, and then we take the next the next step, and now it's on F two two two. F two two two. Okay, here is the copy loop. So it takes the source from F from two B. Uh, that was F five seventy six, and then it stores it at the destination, uh, which was O eight D four, and then it's just corrupting that uh, accumulator again and, and storing that in 2B. So it, it's taking something, storing it where it should and then trashing the source. Uh, that's a general strategy it has. Kill everything in memory which has already been used and which you should not use again because if somebody sort of intercepts your process there is nothing visible in the memory that they could use because you have in, or they have ensured that they have trashed it just after they used it um yes 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 so that's that's the loop there um so f2 where is the end of that f250 let's do break f250 okay uh and uh, and now it jumps to 003a which is what i have here as well uh, and now it's just setting the memory to flipping in the kernels again so you see it stores uh 07 into address 0 and that means that basic is flipped in kernel is flipped in and io is flipped in and now it's jumping to 08 d4 very good um yes Okay, and uh, so here it's it's taking uh, well setting up a command to the disk drive. 
uh, it doesn't need any file name and then it's opening stuff because what it's doing now is doing memory write it will it will take from the computer memory and write it into uh, disk drive memory so here is 0004 that means that its address this is the source address it will read from here so reading from the very top of screen memory on the C64 and then uh, it's storing uh, 00 or 0300. That is the destination address in the in the disk drive RAM. So it's taking from 0400 in the computer and storing it in at 0300 in the disk drive memory. Uh, and here it's sending. I'm I'm sure that's the memory right right M095D. Yes, memory write. So what it's doing here is, is issuing a command to the disk drive that, uh, okay, now I will send you hex 20 bytes of data. That's the maximum you can send this method. And then you need to do the uh, issue that uh, here comes another 20 and here comes another 20 until you're done. So this is what it's, this routine is doing. It's taking from the screen memory, poking that into the disk drive memory. And then there is a, a concluding memory execute when it's done. So it's launching the, the, the code on in the disk drive afterwards. Uh, yeah, oh, the 0944, uh, we can do it. Uh, 0944, so uh, this is sort of at the end of the, of the disk drive programming session. 0963 here, 0963, that is the memory execute. So here it's... Uh, here it's sending memory execute, um, and then I'm, I'm sure this sends. Uh, it's it's probably launching uh, the address 0300. It, it will make sense. I haven't checked this, but I think it's 03. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, so it has already stored. Uh, let's. I should. Uh, so it's it's memory execute, and then 0003. So this means if it's sending this little portion to the disk drive, it means that the disk drive should execute the code that is now in disk drive memory on 0300. There you go. Um, Let's see where we are now. Um, okay. Uh, 91. Yes. Oh, we. We do like this to clean up the uh, the breakpoints. Okay, um, I, I just let it do that thing now. So the disk drive is now programmed, and um, what it's doing now is here you see that it's overwriting the the screen memory with stuff again. So it has programmed the drive trash all traces of that ever happening because you're not supposed to access it. Um, break F2AA. Okay, and then next. Um, and then. Okay, so um, we can do another jump because that is jumping to something. Um, yeah, so. It, so FD77, here uh, it will do a jump subroutine, we, we skipped that one, and then it has a little delay loop. So it, it's, it's loading X and Y with values here, and then it's counting them down. I would assume that this is leaving time for the disk drive routine to conclude what it's doing, probably reading the this uh, the key from the uh, from the track which is the protection of the disk here so this is probably leaving the leaving the uh, the disk drive enough time to do all of that um okay uh i'll i'll cheat a bit here uh because i know where it's going so let's do that okay uh now so it went to two, two, three. So down at the page two here, 
where it's doing uh, a little fiddling of the, um, I, I guess this sort of a jump vector that we use afterwards. Um, yes, yes, yes. I'm storing stuff to zero to the top of the stack. I'm I'm not really sure what it's doing here. I uh, because eventually I will just trash this away. I just need to understand where it's going and and ensure that I can stop it before it's doing something I where I would like it to stop. So um, yeah. FC three. Okay. So this is where it sort of stops. Uh, F FC three E is where the um, the load takes place. Now it's initiating stuff, and this is a, a resident part. FC three E and up onto the top of the memory is the loader routine that stays resident with the uh, with throughout the game. So when it wants to load something, it calls F. C3E and it has a number of parameters here. Uh, if the high, uh, yeah, I would say the, the high nibble of, of a byte it calls in the accumulator is set to zero, then uh, X and Y contains uh, the block. Um, yeah, no, it's it's sort of the load address, I think. Well, th there are parameters. Let's say it like that, so I'm not sure I'm not saying anything wrong. It can feed parameters to the loader, and it picks those parameters, and it can do loading and saving, and it can do track loading and track. Uh, not so, yeah, it can do track saving as well. So it's it's a quite flexible loader, and and it's parameter driven. So if you call it using the direct the correct parameters you can do it having to do whatever you want basically um, so the, the first thing it does when it calls this is loading the main menu now because we have we have gone through in the boot we have now gone through the loader and what the loader is going to do now is load the the main file it's going to launch and uh, we are here and we should watch so here you see that on address 7700 um, you see this un uninitiated memory uh, there was this thing it did on 8000 so that's something that the loader poke there uh, it's not used for anything here and it will be overloaded uh, so this is just something it did for its own purpose internally uh, but I wanted to use fill 6000 with with 31 seven 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 zero zero so now I filled it with 31 and the reason I did that because I wanted to show you that it's now doing uh, a loading here um, it will load to seven eight zero zero so that's what the the load uh, that we will do um, uh, so here it, it, the accumulator here is set with the high bit is set to something and then um, and then it's loading from track and sector eight and uh, so track eight sector zero I think that was the the instruction and and this is sort of normal file chain so if you look at in um, yeah we can do that 0800. Uh, I haven't really prepared this but uh, 0800. Uh no. <laughs> Could it be zero zero eight then. No. Bugger. Yeah, let's uh let, let's not do that. That was uh, that was just uh fiddling with it and, and it was seemingly not correct. So um FD five C next break FD five C so here it didn't load. Now that we called FC3E, uh, that was calling the loader, and when loader has been been uh, called, it will revert to um, it will revert to this little piece. So uh, I'll, I'll just let it load, and now you would. Uh, um,
here. So now it's loading and it's warp loading and it's already launched the machine code monitor here again. Uh, FD. Loading has been done. Uh, we should do. Here you see 7700, uh, the ones I filled it with, but it has loaded from 7800. So this is something that was loaded during the loader. And I can. Uh, and you can see here, if you look at the memory here, continue game, and there are text from what's in the menu later on. Okay, and now there is an end. So it loaded up until 9F7F. Nine, uh, That's the last address it loaded. So that is now that the loader has loaded the actual payload that it's supposed to load. Drive is initiated. There is a little uh, wedge in the very top of the memory that the, the, the program can use for loading. That is the fast loader. It validates the protection. Everything is set up. Everything is in place. So the, the only other thing it should do now. Uh, we are at FD 5C. The only thing it should do now is take this little thing FD6A, copy down to address 73 in the memory and then jump to it. And address FD6A is this, load accumulator with 37, store to 01, all RAM uh, banked in, and then jump to 7800. That is launching the program that it has just loaded. Whew. Yeah, I'm sorry if this hasn't been really consistent. It's very difficult to read through four different uh, screens and then also record and also uh, try to talk at the same time as I'm trying to think. So if this hasn't been very clear, then sorry. Uh, I do have a document showing most of this. And uh, if you're interested, please ping me and I can send you a link to the Google Docs document that describes the uh, this in more details where I have a full disassembly uh, it's it's basically this I, um, where I have uh, all the documentation and all my comments for for all steps of this I'm not saying this is this is something that is 100% complete in, in every aspect, but uh, it's, it is at least uh, complete enough to use as a guide for going through this yourself and understanding all the details of it. Um, yeah, that was it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching me dissect Pirate Slayer Boot. Thank you. So that was everything we get today. Um, and again, if you are really interested in watching me dig through also the disk drive code, then let me know in the comment down below. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed we will eventually have a talk with Chris because I know he has a really interesting history joining the company Pirate Slayer Boot Inc. and also the work he did before and after that. But uh, yeah, that will be for some other week. Fingers crossed we will have that in the near future. Bye bye.